Well, welcome back to uh, another series of our, our sessions on literal Genesis, where here we, we go by the motto that we should hold firmly to Scripture and hold loosely to theories. And the idea of these theories being mostly related to evolution. How can we go from a rock to a rock star, for example, over, over billions of years? Uh, what are the mechanisms? How does that work? And, and exactly how does that happen? Uh, because we see that this conflates with Scripture, especially the early Genesis, the, the history that we read in, in early parts of Genesis, where that's not the idea that God gives us on how things uh, came about. And today, we're going to kind of continue on our conversation from last week, where we talked about the, the energy of the cell, which is ATP. There's no free lunches. If anything's going to move and have motion, um, you need energy, and ATP is what we found uh, to be the energy to fire those motions. Today we'll take a, um, a, st a step back a little bit and we'll look at the cell as a whole as to how it might resemble a city and then look at some, just some, uh, some stats, right? Uh, what are the odds? What are the odds that some of these things could happen purely by chance? So to get started, uh, we'll look at Hebrews 11.10 where it says, For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now the Hebrew writer here is talking about Abraham who Abraham, he left everything, left his, his home, left his countrymen, and took off on a journey not really knowing where God was leading him. And in fact, he, he lived in tents along the way. And Scripture here is telling us that Abraham wasn't really concerned about finding a permanent city, a permanent home uh, to, to hang his hat in, to call home. He was looking for something better. And in this case, it was a city whose architect and builder was God. Now you think about the creator of the universe. If he's going to architect and build a city, that's got to be something to see, right? And this is kind of the context that I want to keep in, in today's session when we look at the cell in, in ways that it resembles a city. In fact, some researchers have said that the cell more resembles a universe, but we're going to, we're going to keep it uh, to the city level to, to make it more manageable today. And, and to do this thought exercise, we need to kind of compare it to a human-made city that we may build underwater and then you know what are the kind of the things we need just to start off with and I'll, I'll give you some examples first thing we might need blueprints now of course to build any city you're not just going to go you know start off without any kind of plans whatsoever these things need to be planned out you got a lot of complexities going on in a city now how does that relate to a cell we have blueprints for an actual physical city well the cell we've got DNA that's the blueprints and they're compacted down a million times smaller than they need to be to fit into this, this tiny, tiny nucleus, which is amazing. We talked about that in a previous session. So we have actual blueprints for an actual city. We have blueprints for biological systems, for this biological city that we're going to build. What about roads? No city would be complete without roads. Uh, you must have roads. Does the cell have roads? Well, well obviously, I'm not going to put roads up there. If the cell doesn't have roads, of course it does. Uh, it's got different types of roads, and one of those types of roads is called microtubules. Now, we're going to look at some videos here in a moment on some of these, on, on how they might look inside the cell. But just picture these roads stemming out from a central location going to all different parts of the cell uh, because you need to transport things along these roads. It's no different inside the cell than it would be a physical city. We need uh, factories, so we need things manufactured so that we could consume goods. In the cell, these are called ribosomes. And these ribosomes are responsible for, for actually taking blueprints from the DNA and, and making the product from those blueprints. Uh, and it makes all kinds of parts. Now, if you remember back to our, our airplane analogy, when we said we needed manuals to be able to create all these, these, these parts, uh, from the, the raw parts, right, from the very beginning, this is exactly what the ribosome does. It creates multiple different parts uh, from those blueprints of the DNA. Waste management. No city would last very long at all without uh, a way to deal with, with the waste products uh, that come from the, the inhabitants and from product use and cons consumption. It's the same thing in a cell. And in a cell, those are called lysosomes. Lysosomes are, are a very, very important part of, of, of cellular maintenance as they uh, take down parts uh, that are no longer needed. Uh, they, they tear these structures down, and we'll see a video of this in a moment, but it's really more of a, of a recycling type of waste management. 
So we, we think recycling is kind of a somewhat of a new idea. It's not, right? The cell has been doing it since day one and it does it very, very efficiently with lysosomes. Post office. You're going to need a way to, uh, to communicate and to send packages and a central place to do that. In the cell, that's called the Golgi apparatus, where all these packages that are created from the ribosomes, from the factories, uh, are sent to post offices to be boxed up and to be shipped out to other parts of the cell. Uh, if you're getting the idea, hopefully you're getting the idea that this is absolutely amazing, that this miniature micro uh, biological form of a city exists. In, in all of our cells. It, it actually is uh, pretty amazing. Energy, we talked about this last week. Uh, any, any city that's going to be livable, we're going to need some energy, whether that's solar or wind or, or, or coal powered. And the, the cell actually can take different forms, just like the city, and turn those into energy. Uh, for us, that would be things like carbohydrates or fats or, or proteins. And uh, ultimately, as we've seen in our last session, that gets down to the ATP synthase, um, which was a very, very uh, intricate way of creating these ATP molecules. That's done in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. In fact, in each one of our cells, we have about 12 and a half million of those little ATP synthase motors that we looked at last week. Absolutely incredible. Uh, delivery vehicles. So we have these packages that are made by the factories and are in the post office. Well, how do we get them to different places in the cell? Well, that's through vesicles and kinesin proteins, which we'll actually look at a video here in a moment. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite examples here just because of the way it looks in, in the animation. But of course we have delivery vehicles. Why wouldn't? Why wouldn't we in our city? Uh, messaging. We got to have a way to, to communicate with one another, uh, even if, especially for long distances away from one another, that could be email, that could be snail mail. Uh, there's lots of different ways to communicate. And the cell also has various ways to communicate. One way is through the, the nerve cells themselves, right? Sending those electrical signals, those impulses. Uh, but that's just one of many, many different ways. Steel girders, if our city is going to be underwater, we have to have some way to hold up the structure that protects the outside from the inside. And on a cell, that's the cytoskeleton. That's what the cytoskeleton does. But there's something unique about the cell cytoskeleton versus the steel girder. With steel, you, you think is rigid and not, not very pliable, not movable. That's not the way with the cytoskeleton of the cell. Now, these, these structures not only keep the cell uh, the cell shape the way it is, but it's flexible and they're pliable and it can move. So think about these cells that actually move in the body. Um, the shape needs to change at times. These are very, very, very flexible. So not like our steel girders, they're actually uh, better. Uh, you need city hall. You need somewhere where you've got people kind of controlling the, the big picture. As growth happens in the city, you need to plan for expansion and more roads and those sorts of things. Well, in the, the cell, that would be the cell nucleus, right? The cell nucleus is like the city hall. It holds all the plans, holds all the blueprints. We will need uh, medicine and clinics. Hey, people get sick from time to time. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna take care of those residents? Well, in the cell, we have uh, lymphocytes. And lymphocytes can, can branch off into uh, different types of cells like T cells and B cells, but to, particularly the B cells, which is uh, how we form antibodies, right? So it's, it's, it's like a medicine chest, all right there within the cell. Whenever there's things, foreign invaders that shouldn't be there, that's what the job of the lymphocytes uh, is to take care of that. And then like, like any good city, you know, there might be multiple cities that we have in our underwater analogy. Well, how do these cities communicate with one another? Well, in a cell, that's gonna be through hormones where you have cell to cell interactions. Uh, lots of different places in the body produce these hormones like, uh, like kidney, like your heart. And this is one way that they communicate with one another. So this is really just, just kind of the tip of the iceberg. You know, we, we could spend the rest of the session going through more ways that a cell is like a city. But what I want to do next is, is kind of walk through some visual illustrations of some of these, these analogies. And we'll start with the blueprint. What you're looking at here on the screen is, is DNA, if, if you don't recognize that. And it's actually showing you the DNA in several different um, packaging states. So here in this tightly, tightly compact state is the chromosome. 
Now, the, the only time that it's really ta uh, packed this small is when the cell is dividing. Otherwise, it's, it's not packed this small all the time. And then you've got a kind of a, a less packed area here. That's uh, the uh, heterogeneous uh, chromatin or heterochromatin. Then you've got uh, even more loosely packed uh, DNA here. That's called the euchromatin. And in fact, the DNA inside the nucleus is mostly going to be in this, this state here so that it can be easily read. And then finally, in, in the, the more broader state, and there's even a bigger state than this when it's unzipped and actually uh, copying. And this is what we're going to see. So the process of, of copying the blueprint, because the blueprint can't leave the nucleus. It can't leave City Hall. So we need something to make copies of the right section for the right part we need and then take that copy of the blueprint out of City Hall to a factory so that it can be manufactured. So if we start the animation, all you'll see is one of these, these cell workers who understand the DNA, who know exactly where to go in the right spot to start transcribing or making a copy of the blueprint. So whenever something needs to be made in a cell, again, the blueprint can't leave the nucleus, so a copy is made. And this is a chemical copy. And what you'll have at the end of this, this process here is, is a section of the DNA that we call messenger RNA or mRNA. And if you remember back to an earlier session, we talked about the idea of splicing. So this is the section of the blueprint that we're going to splice away the parts that aren't needed and keep the parts that are needed uh, to make, to make the, the ultimate part that we do need, right? And then it's the messenger RNA that's, that's transported outside of City Hall or the nucleus to a factory. And that's what we'll look at next. And to kind of set this video up, We've, we've got these, these kind of purple uh, globular looking structures here. Those are the factories. Those are the ribosomes. And you see this long string of messenger RNA here. Now, in this particular video, we're going to see three factories making the same part at the same time. So this is mass production. And these factories are actually going to, to land on what's called the rough uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But for now, just watch the process. As you see, this, this long strand of, of messenger RNA that we copied from DNA, it's going through the factories. And these factories are actually making a part as it goes through them. When it's finished making the part, you can see these factories, unlike man-made factories, they kind of disassemble and they float somewhere else to wherever else they need it. So they're mobile, mobile factories, right? Now, you may be wondering, well, where's the part that it made? Well, we can't see that because if you look at these, these kind of these bumps on the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, these are actually uh, transport modules. So the part that's made actually gets pushed down into the, the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. What does it do in there? Well, from there, it goes to shipping. So there's a series of tunnels and, and kind of pathways underneath this uh, the structure that we're seeing here where the, these parts, these finished parts, are getting ready to be shipped off. Okay, well, once the, the parts are ready to ship, they actually go to another um, area of the cell, which we're not going to show a video of, called the Golgi apparatus. And it's like the post office, where once these parts arrive, you know, it's, it's, things are kind of sorted and boxed up and put on different vehicles so that they can be transported to different parts of the cell. Well, what do those vehicles ride on? Well, they, they, they ride on roads, so they walk on roads. And what you'll see in this video, or this animation, is these microtubules... These are the roads dynamically assembling. They make themselves whenever they need to. And if you look down further here, when we start playing the animation, you'll see a road kind of being torn apart. So these roads are built and they're torn apart. They're built and they're torn apart as they're needed dynamically, uh, all coming from this, this central part of the cell, this Golgi apparatus or, or the post office, if you will. And this, is, this is absolutely stunning to, to watch the animation. Imagine Poor Darwin, looking at the cell in the 1850s, not having a clue of the complexities that are going on inside of these miniature cities. It's not his fault. He did the best he could with the knowledge that he had at the time, but our knowledge has grown so much more. Um, we know better. We know that these aren't just globs inside of, of tissue. There's a lot of things going on here. Well, after we get the roads built, 
we got to have some kind of a, a worker, right, or a vehicle to, to, to take these parts from the post office and deliver them to the parts of the cell. And that's what we're looking at here. You'll see this, this big uh, round kind of a, uh, it's, it's a sack, right? And it's actually full of parts. It's full of these proteins and, and enzymes um, that we built in those ribosome factories. And they're, they're being shuttled across the microtubules by this kinesin protein. And watch this kinesin protein as it looks it's like it's literally walking along this road that has been built. Kind of looks like a stick figure. These feet that are moving, I call them feet. By the way, what's powering those feet? ATP, right? With, with each step that that kinesin protein takes, there's an ATP uh, mod, a fuel molecule that's being expanded, or expended, excuse me, uh, to, to cause this walking motion. And these little kinesin proteins can walk as much as 120,000 steps along these roads to, to deliver their packages. Now, if you were to equate that to a postal carrier on foot, that would mean that postal carrier would walk 45 miles with his bag of mail. Absolutely stunning, incredible. The things that are going on in our cells at, at the micro level. Well, what about the, uh, the, the waste management? Uh, again, to kind of set this one up, you'll see these, these floating particles. Now, everything kind of floats in the cell because it's a, it's a cytoplasm. It's, a, it's mostly water and then kind of a gel-like substance. But you see all these, these things kind of floating around in here. Well, what are those? Well, some of those are, are amino acids. They're, they're building blocks, right? Some of them are going to be uh, nucleic acids. Um, there's lots of parts floating around. Some of them are going to be ATP, the energy molecule. So as, as things need energy, they grab one of these molecules and they, they use it. So these things are just kind of floating all around in the cell. Well, what happens when we have a part that's either no longer needed? Do we just let it take up space in the cytoplasm? Or a part that's, that's old and kind of fulfilled its purpose? Well, no, we don't just leave it flying around like, like space junk. Um, we actually have these lysosomes that float around and they, they attach to these things that need to be broken down. And it doesn't just compact them or, or destroy them or, or burn them up in some kind of a way, but it actually disassembles them and then puts them back out into the, the cellular environment so that the parts can be reused. It's, it's the, the, pre, the prime example here of recycling. And if you watch this, this lysosome, there's another one kind of over there, you'll see it looks like it's leaving behind a trail of debris. Well, that, that's not debris. That is the building blocks of the thing that it's tearing down. And you might think of it like um, I've, got, I've got a stack of lumber and, and maybe I build a picnic table out of it. Well, I use the picnic table for, for a few years or however long I need it, and, and now I don't need it anymore. It's taking up space in my backyard. Well, rather than destroy it, I can just take the nails out, disassemble it, and I can reuse the boards. It's kind of the same principle here with the lysosomes. And inside of these lysosomes are enzymes that are very, very good at, at breaking down things. And then the last kind of animation we'll look at here is energy production. We, we've already seen one animation of ATP synthase, so this is kind of a different uh, uh, type of animation. But to kind of set this one up, we have the, the inner membrane of the, the mitochondria, which is kind of like the, uh, the powerhouse, the power generation house of the cell. And then here's the, the, the motors on ATP synthase. Uh, we have the, the rotor up here that's going to rotate. And as this is going, you'll, you'll notice these, these kind of little components flying into the side. Those are the, uh, the protons that powers the motor. We talked about this. And it drives this shaft. And as the shaft turns, you notice this bump. And as it kind of hits these three appendages on the bump, you'll notice these, these uh, chemicals coming in, ADP, and then there's an extra phosphate uh, chemical there. And as this thing rotates, it energizes it and it, it makes ATP. So if you remember back when I talked about ATP, there were three phosphate molecules. So it takes ADP with the two phosphates and then it crunches on that third one, kind of like a spring, compresses it down. Uh, and this thing is, is greatly reduced in speed. If we were to speed this up in real time, uh, these, these motors would be spinning at about a rate of 9,000 RPM. So very, very fast. And again, these things are creating ATP constantly um, in the mitochondria. 
So these are just some of the ways that the cell is like a city. And when we look at some of the animation, we can see it really does look like a city with roads and pathways and uh, waste management and energy production. And it reminds me of a verse in Matthew 5.14 where Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And it's true. Uh, when you think about uh, a, a city or even a house that's up in the upper elevation on a hill, you, you see that, especially at night with the lights on. And when I think about the city of the cell, we can go back to the invention of the scanning electron microscope, which is 1937. Uh, with the invention of that microscope, we've been able to see more and more and more details. And we make these microscopes better and better and better uh, each decade, so that now we can actually see inside the nucleus and, and actually take a 3D journey down the DNA molecule, such incredible detail. And these kinds of things can't be hidden. Just go in and type a search on the internet about the, the inner workings of a cell. There's so much information. And this is one I, what I think about when I think about this, the city of the cell. It's like it can't, can't be hidden. It was hidden back in Darwin's day. They had no idea. In our day, we have no excuse. We, we know the details of the cell. And it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. Well, how big are these cities that I'm talking about inside the cell? Here we have a picture of Tokyo with the, the famous uh, Tokyo Tower. It's a radio transmission tower. And if I got my stats correct, there's about 38 million people that live in Tokyo. It's the largest inhabited city on the planet. 38 million people. Now we compare that to the cell. The cell has about 42 million residents, if we think about residents being proteins. Aside from proteins, there's other objects, obviously, trillions of them, in every one of the trillions of cells that we have in our bodies. Uh, so these really, really are like cells. When we talk about the numbers, we talk about uh, how it behaves like a city even. Well, what are the odds that Tokyo could build itself over time? What if I, I took a big pit and I threw in a bunch of cement and electrical cables and, and elevators and uh, you know, maybe some uh, uh, wireless uh, access points for wireless communication through all this stuff in a big pit and then maybe give it a billion years and come back? Do you think I would have Tokyo? No, nobody ever would, would think that way uh, because we know that the odds of that of happening, are, they're impossible. But when it comes to the cell, we think that it could have happened by chance, or at least that's what we're taught. So let's take a look at some of these odds. What do the actual numbers show? Is it, is it really possible? Now, if I were to, uh, to take a rock, and I were to wait for a night of a full moon, and I were to go outside, and I, I threw this rock as hard as I could at the moon, do you think I could hit it? Uh, no, you don't think I could hit it? What if I, I, I worked out for, for 10 years and built up a lot of arm strength? Do you think I could ever hit the moon with a rock thrown from the surface of the earth? I, I don't think so either. That's an impossibility. Well, someone has put the odds to this. So remember, when it comes to odds, you can put an odd to just about anything. That doesn't mean it's possible. That just means there are mathematical odds. And the odds of this happening is 1 in 10 to the 50th power. In case you're a little rusty on your exponential math, I've, I've put a, that's a one followed by 50 zeros. So if I try this many times, one of those times, mathematically speaking, I'm going to be successful in hitting the moon. Well, am I really going to be successful even if I do it twice that many times? No, it doesn't matter how many times I try, that's never going to happen. There's a lot of reasons for that. That's why when we see this number 10 to the 50th power, it's considered a statistic impossibility. So it's, it's, it's going to be impossible. Even though there's, there's an odds for it, one in this many times, that doesn't mean it could ever happen. It's really considered a, a statistical impossibility. So we keep this number in mind, this 10 to the 50th power, and let's look and kind of relate that to the cell. So if we're going to have a, a single cell, like this one shown here, eventually become a male and a female because that's what we need for reproduction in humans. There's a lot of changes that have to take place. Hundreds of thousands, millions, billions. Uh, there, there's a lot of changes. If this cell is going to become humans over time, so what are the odds of that happening? Somebody worked that out. Dr. Francisco Ayala 
has calculated the odds of being 1 in 10 to the, what's that? 1 millionth power. How close are we to 10 to the 50th? We're, we're, this number is so huge, it's, it's really unimaginable. It's really unthinkable. Yeah, we can write it in scientific notation, but this number is meaningless. It is so far beyond 10 to the 50th power, it's, it's beyond uh, possible. However, Dr. Ayala left out a few things. Well, three other scientists came back behind him and said, no, it's more like 10 to the 24 millionth power. He forgot a few factors. Well, someone else from Yale actually came back, Harold Morowitz, and said, no, they're both wrong. It's more like 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. Now, we're not going in the right direction for evolution, are we? We're, we're going in the wrong direction here in, in terms of, of odds and, and uh, statistics. This number, again, is so big, it's, it's unusable. We can't do anything with that number. It's incredibly, incredibly large. Well, maybe we're, we're starting out too grand. So we're starting out with, with a single cell that's already got all the, the parts working, which, never mind, you know, I mean, and now we're trying to get that down to, to humans. Well. Let's just see, what are the odds that this cell could even come into existence by itself, by chance random processes? Well, that's also been worked out. And that has worked out to be 1 in 10 to the 57,800 power. So no longer are we going from a cell to a human. Now we're just saying, what are the odds a cell? Even, even a simple, and I put that in quotes there, simple cell could evolve by itself by natural chances. Again, this number is, is astronomically huge. And to kind of give you an idea, of why I say that's, that's still too huge. If you think about how small an atom is, you know, everything is made up of atoms. Um, well, you know what they say about atoms, right? Don't, don't trust an atom because they make up everything, right? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, but it's true, they make up everything, and it's very, very tiny. So how many atoms do you think are, are in your fingertips right now? Billions and billions. Uh, how many atoms do you think are in your entire body? Well, that's been estimated to be one or to be 10 to the 27th power. That's how many atoms are in your body. How many atoms do you think are the entire universe? That's also been calculated. That's 10 to the 82. Think about the vastness of the universe. Now, there's a lot of empty space in the universe. There's a lot of objects, a lot of galaxies, a lot of stars, hundreds of billions. And when we look at this number, 57,800, that's so far beyond the total number of atoms in the universe. Do you, you see the kind of scale, the numbers we're talking about here? Well, maybe we're still being too, too grandiose in our, our desires here. Let's, instead of saying, how does a simple cell form by chance? We know that each of these cells, like these, these uh, amoebas here, I think these are amoebas, they've they got proteins. They've got tiny little proteins in them. No, no cell operates without proteins. So what are the odds that we could even get one protein to form by itself and fold in the proper shape out of nature. Well, it's 10 to the 164th power. And as an example, I've got the HSP protein. It's, a, it's better known as the heat shock protein. Whenever uh, your, your body is under duress or your cells are in duress, this protein is, is produced in rapid amounts uh, to compensate for that stress. It's a very important protein. What are the odds we could get a protein like that? You can see this one's kind of folded in a, in a unique shape there, a hexagonal shape. Well, 10 to the 164. The numbers are getting lower, so that's better, right? This number is still so huge, so huge. So we need to do another thought experiment to kind of get an idea of how big this number is. I heard this uh, a while back, and it's kind of stuck with me. I like the example, so I'm going to use it here. And let's say you, you go to the beach, and you pick up a single grain of sand. Just one, one grain of sand, and you color it, because we're going to need to find this sand later on, this grain of sand. And um, we're going to actually need to find it out of more sand, so we don't need to color it to a color that could be confused with other types of sand. We know we have green sand. There's actually black sand. I've seen green sand beaches, black sand beaches. So maybe you color it purple. You color the sand purple, the one grain of sand purple. And now you fill the earth from the core to the surface with sand, and your one grain of sand that you colored is in there somewhere. I don't know where. And you've got one chance to reach down, pick up a grain of sand, and for that to be your purple colored sand. What do you think the odds are of that? Well, the odds 
are 1 in 10 to the 30th power. Again, we're thinking about this 10 to the 164. The odds of you finding that one grain of sand out of an Earth-sized package of sand is, is 1 in 10 to the 30th power. You see how these numbers are, are so huge? But we need to get this number higher. So let's just go big. Let's just go real big. Take the known universe somewhere along 90 billion light years across. Incredibly huge. Makes us feel so small when we look out at God's creation, doesn't it, sometimes? Let's take the whole universe and fill it all with sand. All the empty spaces, all the objects, they all become sand. Everything is sand. We put your one grain of colored sand somewhere in the entire universe. We fly you in a rocket ship anywhere you want to go. You reach out and you pick up one grain of sand. What are the odds that it's going to be your colored piece of sand? That would be only 1 in 10 to the 96th power. You see how far we are from 164? So far. Um, the, and, and again, we're, we're well above 10 to the 50th, which is a statistical impossibility, right? Now, you can believe in evolution if you want to, right? I've said that before. I'll, I'll say it again. But you need to understand what you're putting your faith in. I don't have enough faith to believe in a process because not only the odds are stacked up against it, but our own observation in life shows us that it doesn't work the way that Darwin thought it worked. Here's a quote from Fred Hoyle. You may be uh, familiar with that name. He's actually the one who coined uh, the, the phrase Big Bang. He, he did it in, um, out of sarcastic jest. So he, he never liked uh, that it stuck, but uh, that's the way it is. But he says the notion that, only, that not only biopolymers, but the operating program of a living cell can be arrived at by chance in a primordial organic soup here on the earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. Now, Fred Hull is very, was very respected. Uh, he passed away, I believe, in, in 2001. Uh, contributed a lot to science, a lot to astronomy and to physics. And here he's saying that uh, he used the word bi biopolymers. That's another way to say a protein. Remember, we're talking about the odds of just a, a, a single protein arising and folding in a proper shape by chance, 10 to the 164th power. He says the, the notion that that could happen or that the operating program, and he uses kind of the, uh, the, the English way of spelling program there. It's not a, not a spelling error. What is he talking about with operating program? That's, that's the DNA. That's the blueprint. He says either one of these arising by chance is nonsense of a high order. Now, Fred uh, Hoyle, Dr. Hoyle, was, was an atheist, right? But he believed in intelligent design. If you research uh, what he did believe, he never believed that chance created life. He says it's too complex, it's, it's too impossible. Um, and he actually worked out his own odds, which I don't have in, in the deck here, but uh, uh, it's astronomically too high to have happened. So he believes that life was intelligently designed. Well, how can that be if he's an atheist? Well, he didn't believe God did it. He believed that extraterrestrials somewhere out in space did it. Um, so he was another pioneer of panspermia, which we talked about in, in a previous session. Um, so intelligent design, yes. A creator God, no. He, he couldn't allow for that. Uh, but again, saying that aliens did it really only kicks the can down the road a little ways. And now you have to explain the aliens and how they could have arisen biologically by chance. And, and once you do that, if they were made by even intelligent, more intelligent aliens, now you just, well, where did they, can you see the problem? You just keep going back and back and back. At some point, you need a creator who's transcendent, who's outside of time, outside of space, who could have brought it all together. That's the most logical conclusion you could come to, in my opinion. So how do we know if something is intelligently designed or not? And, and I'll use SETI as an example here. Um, you see some of these, these large uh, radio array uh, telescopes pointing up, and their sole purpose in life is to listen. And they do some transmission too, but they mostly listen. What are they listening for? They're looking for signs of intelligence somewhere out there in the cosmos. And what they see is, or what they hear, what they are listening to is, what you would call mm, background radiation, just, just kind of a, a low-level noise, right, that's just constant all the time. Now, if they were to see something different, if they were to hear something different, do you think that would be an implication of, of intelligence, especially if it was an ordered signal? Absolutely. They would shout it from the rooftops. There's intelligence out there. We, we received this, even if it was a coded message, 
We have the ability to know if something uh, is a code or not, uh, even if we don't understand the code. Uh, that's, DNA is a good example of that. And in fact, this actually happened in August, I think, of 1977. In Big Ear uh, Radio in Ohio, one of these, these SETI locations that was listening, and they received a small signal that was different than the background noise. And they circled it on a piece of paper and wrote WOW next to it. It's become known as the WOW signal. And for 40 years, it has been thought that this came from, from an intelligent source. And it only amounted to be about like, like six characters, and I put characters in quotes there. Uh, yet for 40 years, they believed that this must have come from, and some still believe it. Now, others think now maybe it might have come from a, a passing by comet. But the, the point is, in the, the normal radiation that they were listening to, they received what looked like an ordered signal of just six characters, and they proclaimed it from the rooftops for 40 years. Well, what are the implications of a code that's three billion characters long that still we haven't fully cracked because it's, it's level after level after level. It's like having a book with a table of contents, with a table of contents, with a table of contents. It's metadata upon metadata upon metadata uh, if you're a programmer. Would that be a sign of intelligence? If we shouted from the rooftops that we received six abnormal characters from our listening to space, when here we have three billion ordered characters in a code that we still don't fully understand, but yet somehow that's not from an intelligent source. I'm telling you, as a Christian, you do not have to hang your head low when you say you believe that God created. That is the most logical explanation we have. Uh, we talked about this in the last, last several sessions, that codes don't come from nature. They don't come from molecules. The medium by, by which you have a code, by which you write a code on, is, is secondary. I could write a code on a, on a blackboard, I could write it on a piece of paper, I could put it in an electronic signal with ones and zeros. That's, that's arbitrary. The primary thing we need to think about is where does the code, where does the concept of the code come from to begin with? It always, always comes from a mind. And while we're kind of on this topic of, uh, of alien life, I wanted to put this in here. I get asked this a lot. Uh, what do you think about aliens? Isn't it possible God could have created aliens? Well, is it possible? Of course, he could have created life on other planets. Well, what does Scripture say? Isaiah 45, 18. For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it, He established it, and did not create it as a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no one else. Well, what's God telling Isaiah here? He's saying, yeah, I made all the other places that you see in the universe but I only made one to be inhabited. And when we point our telescopes out to space and we see all these, these, these magnificent structures and planets, some of them are, I, I call, they have an eerie beauty about them. They're beautiful because of all the different landscapes and designs, but they're eerie because they're barren. There's no life there. Um, and God says, I did this on purpose. When we look out at the universe, we shouldn't get the sense that, oh, it's a shame we're the only ones. We should get the sense that God did this for us. And He gave us all the evidence that we need uh, if we just take, ten, take the time to look around to see it. Now, again, going back to Darwin, Darwin had a, had a bottom-up approach where he believed that you could take something simple and a few, and over time they kind of get together and make something bigger, a little more complex, and that gets together with other molecules and bigger complex, and eventually you get humans, right? From rocks to rock stars, like I said at the beginning. Uh, that bottom-up approach, that's not observational. That's not what we see. That's not what we see in science. That's not what we see every day. The, the industry that I'm in, um, information technology, cybersecurity, if you're going to create something complex, it's a top-down approach, meaning the concept always starts in a mind, and then you, you go out and you develop that concept. If you're going to build a city, it's the same way. You have a concept in a mind, you start creating blueprints, you plan, you uh, years and years of planning by city councils, uh, even just for, for things like annexing a small piece of land and what are we going to do with that land. We're going to put uh, substations there, power, water, uh, all these things. It, it's a top-down approach. And the most beautiful example I can think of in Scripture of a top-down approach to creation is the very first verse in the very first chapter of the very first book. In the beginning, God. There's our top-down approach. 
that not only makes sense, that's observational. That's what we experience. God, in His infinite mind, conceptualized all of creation, us, you and me, everything. And that's how it all began. It wasn't a bottom-up. Bottom-up doesn't work in nature. And then what we'll end on uh, our, our kind of our anchor verse here we've been using throughout these, these series, Psalms 139.14. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Again, I thank you for your attention in this session. If we look ahead to the next session, we'll take a, kind of one more look at the, the partner or the companion uh, way that uh, mutations are supposed to supposedly work, and that's natural selection. Look forward to talking to you then.